All right. Okay, so we shall begin. Uh, last week, we had our part one of making sense of worship and church. And we talked about the fourfold uh, pattern of worship, isn't it? We talked about the gathering, we talked about the word, we talked about the meal, and we talked about the sending forth. And how this is important uh, in the way we worship, how that helps us to get a sense of who we are as we gather. We receive God's word for our lives. We partake in Christ through the communion. And then we are sent off back into the world for his mission. Right? So that's what we talked about last week in our making sense of worship and church in the first session. Today, in this second session, we will be talking about making sense of worship and church with regards to the sacraments that we Protestants celebrate, the baptism and the Holy Communion. All right? So the, um, the development of how we'll be doing it today would be uh, part one, we'll be talking about baptism, the theology and practice of, and then part two, the theology and practice of Holy Communion. All right? So we said last week that we want to come and uh, gather and so I'm going to be using this daily office from the Church of England. Of course, uh, our Methodist founder, John and Charles Wesley, they were, they were Anglicans, Anglican priests. Uh, and uh, that's what uh, the Church of England is. And so um, I don't know whether at a point in time they, would have, they have developed the daily office or not. But the pattern of you know, coming uh, for morning prayer, the pattern of having a collect prayer thereafter, and then responding in words of scriptures, uh, that would have been familiar to John Wesley. So let's do it uh, via this website of the Anglican Church. Uh, can you all see this? The morning prayer yes. uh, 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 what's that? Um, website, you can, right? Yes. Yes. So I'm going to ask uh, maybe again Agnes to respond uh, with me together to this um, words printed in bold for Agnes, all right? So, O Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Your light springs up for the righteous and all the peoples have seen your glory. Bless, oh, so, sorry, I said the bold one for you, all right. So blessed are you, sovereign God, King of the nations. To you be praise and glory forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, your name is proclaimed in all the world. As the sun of righteousness dawns in our hearts, anoint our lips with the seal of your spirit, that we may witness to your gospel and sing your praise in all the earth. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. forever. Amen. And so we will be singing a hymn, uh, and the hymn that we'll be singing will be Come, O Thou Traveller Unknown. It is a hymn written by Charles Wesley, and it is about, you know, uh, Jacob wrestling with God, right? And, um, and wanting a blessing from God. Uh, and this song is significant because when Charles Wesley passed on, John Wesley uh, was doing, uh, was saying a eulogy for him, and uh, John Wesley used this song and he began by singing this song and he came to a certain part in the song. Uh, let's see whether you can tell which part is it. Uh, John Wesley began to tear because uh, his companion is now gone. And so let's worship together with this. Come, O thou traveller unknown, and ask God to come and uh, bless us even this time together as well. All right. And so we continue with our... Um, morning uh, daily office by responding now to this hymn Oh be joyful in the Lord all the earth serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song know that the Lord is God it is he that has made us and we are his we are his people and the sheep of his pasture uh, hang on I've lost my screen uh, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is gracious. His steadfast love is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Amen. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. Let us spend a few moments of silence, even as we commit ourselves individually to the Lord right now, this session, and the rest of the day as well. Thank you, Lord. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. 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 All right. So now we will carry on to look at our session for today on the sacraments. What is a sacrament? So this um, uh, session is taken uh, in part from this book. It's written by my lecturer in TDC. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Truscott. He's a Lutheran. Uh, and so uh, some of what he has written would have a Lutheran perspective, but because he's a lecturer in a seminary, he will give a broad perspective of the various traditions as well. All right. So he wrote this book, The Sacraments, A Practical Guide. I think this is his third book, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. All right. So what is a sacrament? Well, uh, the word sacrament comes from the ancient Roman milieu, and it talks about a soldier's solemn oath of loyalty, right? Uh, and uh, there's a connotation of an obedience, implicit obedience to the commanders and to the state. And so when uh, they say that the soldier has laid down a sacrament with uh, uh, the unit or the commanding uh, commander, uh, it conveys this sense of a sacred covenant between the two parties, right? So, and so when we talk about a sacrament that uh, Jesus or God has instituted for us, it's a sense that God has put this sacred covenant in place so that there's a sense of loyalty, both for us to him as well as him to us. He's committing his presence. He's committing his grace, even as we partake of this sacrament together, right? Uh, and so there is this sacred covenant between God and us, and us and God, even as we partake of the sacraments. Um, in the medieval Western church, they um, had instituted seven sacraments. And so baptism, confirmation, the Lord's Supper, penance. Penance is that private confession, right? So we see in the Catholic church, uh, even right now, uh, and I get a sense that they don't use it as much, but uh, there is still that conf confession booth. So they will go into the booth uh, where, the, where the priest is and then they'll make their confession. So to them, it's a sacrament. In that confession, there is a grace being poured out upon them in that forgiveness, uh, in that, in that uh, sense of uh, restoration uh, we've got. And so they see penance as a sacrament. Uh, to me, I think that sense of uh, confession being a means of grace is something that actually we Protestants uh, have not been able to practice as much, isn't it? Um, and maybe we have lost a bit of that. You know, we encourage ourselves in connect groups to meet up with one another uh, and to share lives with each other. But how many of us actually, you know, really confess our sins to one another and have the other person say to us, you know, now they have confessed your sin, the Lord is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins. You know, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Uh, we, we don't, right? And so the sense of being able to confess, find forgiveness and restoration with God, you know, we only now do it during Holy Communion. And that's why Holy Communion is even more so important. And so maybe we can recover a part of this, you know, uh, confession thing, even in our connect groups. Uh, I think that's quite important as well. All right. And then extreme unction is another sacrament, which is the last rites and then ordination and marriage. So the medieval Western church had seven sacraments. Uh, whereas for us uh, Protestants, uh, we only have two sacraments, uh, and that is the baptism and Holy Communion. And there have been some debate among scholars why these two were chosen, but generally uh, most agree that it is because these are the two sacraments expressly commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels, right? Uh, Jesus said, uh, in Matthew uh, 28, right? Go uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's commandment one. And number two, Holy Communion, do this in remembrance of me, right? So expressly commanded by Jesus Christ. And so we retain those that are expressly commanded by Christ. 
uh, as sacraments. And the rest, we ought to practice uh, the rest of the Western, what Western church have, like the confirmation, marriage, and, and uh, even confession, right? We still practice those, but we don't consider them sacraments, all right? So sacraments uh, for us conveys a means of grace. There is this a spiritual significance uh, to the sacraments, uh, and there is benefit for those who partake in them. We find forgiveness, we find healing, we find restoration, right? There is spiritual significance and benefit when we part participate in the sacraments because they convey God's grace to us. Um, the free church tradition, and they, these uh, will include the Pentecostals, the Baptists, uh, they won't call sacraments sacraments. They will call them ordinances, right? Um, because they uh, see these actions uh, as being performed in obedience to a commandment. It is more of a thing that we remember uh, for them. It is a remembrance of a commandment that Christ has given us to signify or to point to that grace uh, of Christ himself. So there, isn't, there is a less of a sense of this very tangible presence, this tangible grace being poured out. It is, a, it is more of a remembrance, all right? And so uh, for us, the significance of sacrament is this, that it's meant to sanctify us because it helps us to have a sense of belonging to God and a belonging to his community, right? Uh, as a people of God, we gather. And when we gather for Holy Communion, we are reminded that we are one people in Christ. Uh, we don't do sacrament, uh, Holy Communion individually, right? Uh, we ought not to uh, because we need to come together as a body of Christ to do so. Uh, we remember, we remember our sense of identity to God and we remember ourselves, right, as the body of Christ, different parts of the body coming together as a body of Christ. Uh, it is integral to the life of the church. The church in its entirety has always practiced the sacraments. They have always, the church has, the universal church in time and space has always baptized. It has always uh, Partaken of, partaken of the Lord's Supper together, there's a sense of unity and there's a sense of witness as well, isn't it? When the world watches on, hey, these people, they are taking Holy Communion, they know straight away we are, they are Christians. We are, we are Christians, isn't it? So there's a sense of witnessing to the world. Why? Because it's always been part of the life of the church. And then there is the, that spiritual significance made tangible in, in a very corporal sense, in a very bodily sense. Um, it is like, you know how, because we are bodily creatures, right? We are creatures with flesh and blood. Um, when we sometimes talk about oh, God's presence, God's means of grace for us in a very intangible, uh, you know, non-physical way, it's difficult sometimes for people to be able to catch the idea or to experience it in its fullness. And so God knows, God knows he, he has made us in human flesh and now he has made that spiritual significance tangible for us to be able to receive it for ourselves, whether is it through the water in baptism or through the body, uh, through the uh, bread and the wine or the juice uh, in Holy Communion. It is His grace made tangible, that spiritual uh, thing made tangible for us in a very physical thing for us, for our consumption and for our use. All right. And it facilitates this sense of encounter. Uh, We've got because of this very tangible sense of his presence, it creates a sense that we are encountering God uh, in a very real uh, way. Um, my parents are Anglicans, but somehow you know they never they never baptized me. And in their Anglican tradition, um, their their idea is that um, someone only comes for Holy Communion when they have been baptized, right? Uh, and I remember they had started attending Wesley Methodist Church uh, after some time. So although they were Anglicans and they still call themselves Anglicans, but they started attending the Methodist uh, Church. And attending with them, you know, I listened after a while when I was in the university, uh, I listened to these words, right? And the words say, um, uh, Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, earnestly repent on our sins and seek to repent. Eh? Christ invites to his table all who love him, earnestly repent of our sin, and seek to live in peace with one another, right? So these are the words. And I listened to those words and I said, I think that says that you need to be baptized, you know. 
So I went forward. I went forward to receive the Holy Communion. And I remember that very first time when I went up to receive Holy Communion for myself, even though I was not baptized yet, you know, it was like, wow, that sense of I'm going to encounter God, I'm going to encounter God. I make a decision today, I'm going to encounter God, you know, because this is Holy Communion. I see everybody all these years growing up, they taking Holy Communion. And in the Anglican Church, you know, in the past, right, they would pass the elements by you. And then because you're not baptized, you're like, okay, I got to pass it on to somebody else. I cannot partake it myself. And then, wow, I, you know, I, I always sense, oh, I'm not encountering God like they are. But at that time, when I went up there, it's like, wow, I'm going to encounter God for myself for the very first time. And that's, so significant, right? So there is a sense of encounter with God, even as we partake of Holy Communion. So um, the sacraments, sacramental actions by God have always been recorded uh, throughout the scriptures. In the Old Testament, we read of how uh, God used physical things to facilitate theophany. Theophany means an encounter with the divine, encounter with theo, God. Um, and so, for example, God revealed himself to, the, to Moses through the burning bush, right? Um, God revealed himself and his presence mightily to his people in Exodus 13, uh, cloud by day and fire by night. Uh, God used these very tangible expressions of how he is present with these people. Uh, and God conveyed uh, his intentions uh, through uh, certain actions that the people did in a very physical way. For example, in Numbers 21, the people had to look at the serpent on the pole to find forgiveness and healing after their rebellion against God, right? So there's a sense that uh, God has instituted something that they can do in a very physical way so that that spiritual significance of forgiveness and healing comes upon them. And uh, that is uh, a sacramental action in the Old Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, we also see God instituting uh, certain actions that can be done by humans so that uh, they receive uh, a sense of uh, the spiritual restoration uh, for themselves, the spiritual means of grace for themselves. For example, the practice of sacrifices, right? Um, uh, and they find through the sacrifices that they make, forgiveness and atonement. Uh, the Passover was also a institution in uh, was also uh, an institution by God, where every year they had to celebrate the Passover and helps them to remember. Uh, what God did for them uh, as a nation, as a people, and who they are now in Christ, even as they reenact the the uh, uh, the actions of uh, the Passover, they reenact the story, the narrative of the Passover. Right. So these are human actions instituted by God, so that they re either remember or they experience that spiritual significance for themselves, generation after generations. All right. Um, when it comes to the New Testament, uh, Jesus uh, and the sacraments, uh, we also see that Jesus, in Jesus' time, uh, God used physical things uh, to facilitate theophany as well. The baptism of Jesus was done uh, uh, in the water, right? And the Holy Spirit came down as a dove so that people can see the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jesus, came down in a very physical way, in a, in a form of a dove. Uh, we also see the conveyance of God's actions uh, in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus used his saliva and mud to heal uh, the person with uh, whose eyes uh, cannot see, right? So Jesus conveyed his uh, actions, his sp the spiritual significance and the physical healing uh, in a very uh, physical way as well. And human actions were also instituted by God in the New Testament. And of course, that's baptism as well as the Lord's Supper. So we ask ourselves, right? Uh, these physical things that we use to um, signify a sacrament, uh, what makes these physical things become sacraments, you know? How about other things? Uh, can they become sacraments too? Tea, for example, coffee, you know? Can we use those, right? And so this was a question that uh, was asked uh, uh, in the medieval church. And so the question was, what makes it a sacrament? What makes these elements sacraments? And this guy called Thomas Aquinas, uh, one of the medieval scholars, uh, and many people would follow his uh, principles now in terms of what makes a sacrament. And so he said, three things makes it a sacrament. One, the presence of God must be there. 
right? Because at the end of the day, it's uh, uh, God is the one who brings us his grace, right? God must be present to pour his grace upon us. And what guarantees the presence of God? Of course, uh, God is with you, even as an individual, even as a person. But what guarantees the presence of God? The scripture tells us when two or three are gathered in his name, he's present with us, right? So in the gathering of a community, of assembly, and that is why we don't do private baptisms, even when we have, you know, baptism with, uh, let's say, the, the sick uh, and the very, very elderly, even the hospitals, as pastors, we will try to ask, when you bring your family members here or your, your CG members, you know, so that there are at least two or three who are gathered. And so you cannot baptize yourself because there's only one person, right? Minimally, the priest or the pastor, together with you, two person, we gather in the name of God and uh, we baptize or we have Holy Communion together, two person at least, you know. Uh, so presence of God, that's one. Number two, uh, the corporal elements, the very physical elements, whether is it the water uh, for Holy Communion or the bread and the wine or juice for Holy Communion, right? So there must be a very physical uh, a tangible way in which this means of grace is being conveyed. Uh, and, we have talk, and we have talked about that uh, sense of that physicality uh, of the sacramental actions instituted by God throughout the whole of history already. All right. And then, of course, the finally, uh, we need to be intending to come to celebrate this sacrament together. All right. It's not just any water, like, you know, wow. Uh, go to the tap, and, oh, I'm baptized already. No, right? There must be these words of invocation where we invite the Holy Spirit to come. And that is why in the uh, ritual of uh, the Holy Communion, uh, in the ritual of the baptism, we say, right, make this water, you know, the means for which, uh, so we're saying, we're asking the Holy Spirit to come and make this particular water, this water that's been set apart, set aside uh, for this use of baptism, right? So we say that. In the Holy Communion, we say, uh, Holy Spirit, um, make this, it, or the, what, what, what are the words? Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. So, right, we're asking Christ, Holy Spirit to come and to make this the body and blood of Christ for us, for our partaking. So there's this intention to make these elements the elements for the sacrament. Okay, so all these three uh, must be present and most would follow this principle laid out by Thomas Aquinas. Okay, so this makes it a sacrament. So theology of baptism. Uh, baptism was, of course, instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. So it is a commandment by Christ for us to baptize. Uh, and so we're now going to baptism. Uh, and when it is a commandment uh, by Christ, then all of us uh, ought to follow whether the church, we need to go forth to make disciples, we need to go forth to baptize, or as individuals, given that God, Christ himself, uh, called the church to do so, now we have to respond as individuals to what Christ has commanded for the church to do, we need to go forth to be baptized ourselves, right? And baptism is done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yeah? Uh, in the uh, uh, Trinity, in the name of the Trinity. And so uh, some uh, fringe uh, denominations, um, I think uh, the, one of the movements called the Jesus Movement or something, uh, they baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's it. Uh, most mainline denominations will not consider that baptism efficacious because we need to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, expressly laid out by our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So all denominations, as long as you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we consider you baptized and we will not re-baptize you. Okay, I'll talk about re-baptism later, but we will not re-baptize you once you've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all right? And so it is a commandment by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we baptize. Secondly, Jesus himself set an example. He himself was baptized uh, by uh, John the Baptist, right? The early church baptized. We read in Acts chapter 2 that, you know, Peter was replying 
uh, to a group who have encountered the Holy Spirit and, the, uh, and, and conviction in their hearts, you know, of their sins and the need for forgiveness. And then they asked Peter, right, then what do, we, what do we do now? So Peter replied to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. So everyone and for generations to come, your children, right? And for all whom the Lord our God will call unto himself. All right? So it is for us all, the early church baptized. And we read in the scriptures in Acts also that it is not only for the Jews, non-Jews, Gentiles were baptized as well. As they travel along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch, and this is an Ethiopian eunuch, said, look, here is water. Who can stand in the way of me being, of my being baptized? And so he gave orders to stop the chariot and both Philip and eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And so for us Gentiles, we ought to be baptized as well. And we not only read that uh, Gentiles were baptized, non-Jews were baptized, but households were baptized. Whole, whole, whole households were baptized in Acts chapter 16, verse 13, when she, Lydia, the lady who sold purple cloths, and so she was a rich family, and the members of her household were baptized, right? So her whole household were baptized. She invited us to her home. We read that in Acts chapter 16. And so we read of uh, how your baptism is a commandment of Jesus. Jesus himself set an example of what it means to be baptized. The early church were baptized, non-Jews were baptized, and whole households were baptized. And so we ought to be baptized as well. Uh, and so we, when we think about baptism, there are so many different aspects of what baptism signifies to us. Number one, uh, baptism and the covenant. In the Old Testament, uh, God laid down uh, his covenant with the people of uh, uh, of himself, uh, the Jews, as he led them out of Egypt. And then he told them, you know, to do this in remembrance of my ex, me who, lead, who led you out of uh, slavery, out of Egypt, do this, therefore, in remembrance of me, right? So the generations after, every single year, the Jews would celebrate the Passover in remembrance of the mighty acts of God being done in the life of the Jews that instituted them as, as a covenant between God and his people, God, and them. And likewise, for us, baptism, therefore, signifies the new covenant that Jesus now, now lays down between God and his people. Uh, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, the new covenant that I've instituted between uh, me and all of you. And so we remember baptism as, uh, sorry, did I confuse myself with uh, Holy Communion? Um, baptism and covenant. So, when the when Abraham sorry when Abraham uh, uh, had a covenant with uh, God, uh, Abraham uh, was told right uh, to circumcise he and all the male family members of his household. And thereafter, the Jews, as they were being led out of uh, Egypt, as they remembered uh, the act uh, of uh, Abraham in covenant with God to circumcise, they themselves. Uh, circumcised, right? They circumcised themselves once again as a act of how they are in covenant with God. And so, likewise, Jesus, in instituting baptism, you know, go baptize them in the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit, institutes how this now is the way in which people now are being called, are being incorporated as, uh, as individuals in uh individuals within the people of God, within the community of God, through uh, baptism. And once they are baptized, just as once the, in the Old Testament, uh, the Jews were circumcised, uh, they are counted as the people of God. And so the uh, people who are baptized are also therefore counted as the people of God. We see themselves as, uh, as baptizing because we bring people into a covenant with God. Okay, so baptism and covenant. Uh, we also talk about, uh, so it gives you a sense of identity. You know, if you're baptized, you are now a person uh, within the community of God. Baptism and atonement. So um, how now we see Jesus uh, going to the cross, dying on the cross for us. And so that sense of 
receiving that sacrifice uh, that atones for our sins, right? And we uh, therefore uh, align ourselves with our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, even as we go down into the water uh, as well. Just as Christ, you know, uh, went to the cross, we are going into the water together with our Lord Jesus Christ. The sense of partaking in the body of Christ, uh, in that uh, act of Christ, uh, and finding Jesus forgiving us even through baptism. Uh, baptism and Christ, because of Christ's own commandment, his own obedience to, uh, to baptism, we ought to therefore also uh, go through baptism. Baptism and forgiveness. Uh, how John's uh, baptism was the baptism of forgiveness and uh, repentance and forgiveness. And Jesus himself went through that baptism. And so therefore, when we go through forgive, uh, baptism, we find forgiveness uh, as well. Baptism and new life. It's about partaking of the cross, going into the tomb, and then uh, being resurrected unto eternal life together with Jesus so going into the water is like going into the tomb. And then when we rise again from the water, we rise again into life, life uh, eternal together with Christ. All right. So that's another way of viewing baptism as well. Uh, baptism as declaration, right? Uh, it is the outward declaration of the inward reality that we have in our lives, that we, are, uh, we believe in Christ. And so that's a... Uh, uh, one of uh, the reasons uh, why people go through baptism as well, and that is to declare the in an outward manner their inward reality in their heart. And so if we see, right, that um, baptism is uh, so multifaceted. There's so many aspects of baptism and why we ought uh, to baptize. And it's not only because we want to declare our allegiance to our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, in recent years, because of the believers' baptism movement and some of the uh, denominations, uh, it seems as if you know uh, people uh, think that baptism is only about oh only when you have now come to receive Jesus Christ, you know, uh, then you want to declare to the world that you are Christian, then you go through baptism. Uh, that's part of it, definitely, and we ought to do so, declare our allegiance. Uh, to Christ, to the rest of the world. But it's not only that, isn't it? There's so much more to baptism. And we see that uh, through all these different aspects of baptism that we see here. All right? And so uh, that's about the theology of baptism. Each line there you see, right, has got so much more to unpack. And maybe next year when we want to uh, uh, flesh out further, we can do a making sense of what baptism means. And that might take us two sessions, then we can go through one by one and flesh them out a lot more, okay? But in the practice of baptism, there have been a number of uh, issues or questions uh, over the years. Number one, infant baptism. And I chose this picture because, oh, the baby is so cute, huh? <laughs> but not only because of that, but because as Methodists, we do practice uh, infant baptism, isn't it? And we practice infant baptism because we believe that baptism signifies a covenant. Uh, with God, and we want to bring our children into a covenant uh, with God. We want them to be counted as the people of God. Rightly so, some people might question, hey, but they have not believed in Jesus Christ themselves. But just as the Old Testament, uh, Abraham was commanded to um, circumcise all, even the children uh, in the house, in the households, in the family, because, uh, you know, they are part of the covenant, they are part of the people of God. Uh, so do likewise. Uh, likewise, for us, we want we see baptism as bringing our children into a covenant uh, with God as well. And so we baptize infants. Okay. Um, how then do they declare their allegiance to God uh, later on when uh, they grow up? Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. Another question that I've been fre uh, frequently asked also uh, will be the modes of uh, baptism, right? We know that in at least in our uh, Singapore Methodist Church context, we practice immersion, we practice sprinkling, and that is you know the sprinkling of the water over the head. Uh, we practice pouring, uh, pouring maybe not so 
uh, often nowadays, but in the old days, I know pastors would pour, you know, like either jugs or even buckets of water over the candidates. And uh, uh, Pastor Michael, our founding pastor, right, uh, he once shared with me how uh, there was once uh, he poured uh, a bucket, full bucket of water uh, onto someone from the second floor. So the, pe- the person who would stand on the first floor and then he pour the whole bag, bucket of water uh, upon him. So, uh, so pouring has been a mode that's been used uh, uh, by us as well, right? And we read that uh, in the Gospels and as well as in Acts that uh, Jesus, when he was baptized, he came out of the water. So there is a um, uh, biblical example of how water was used and Jesus came out of the water. So the sense that um, he was immersed in water. Was he fully immersed? So scholars um uh, we'll debate about this. So the question is whether do we need to submerge the person? You know, does the person need to go fully in the water uh, before he's considered baptized if he's going through immersion or submersion uh, or, you know, uh, not, no need to go in fully. Uh, so there's still uh, debate uh, in this. Likewise, Ethiopian eunuch, right, was baptized. They both went down, down in to the water so the question was, what kind of water was it? So again, the scholars will debate, you know, is it a puddle of water by the side of the road? So how can it go down into the water fully submerged? Or was it like a lake, uh, a reservoir, you know, next to the next to the road? And then they could go down and submerge. So debates there, right, about immersion. But because of these debates, therefore, um, most scholars and most traditions would find that there isn't a fully a need to go down, immerse, submerged under the water. And that spiritual significance is still conveyed fully via sprinkling or pouring, right? And this too uh, will be efficacious. It is about, again, the three things, right, that Thomas Aquinas said, the presence of God, when two or three are gathered. The number two, the elements in a very tangible, physical way. And so water is, uh, suffices. And thirdly, uh, the intention, the invocation, make this water the means for which the grace is being poured out to baptize, right? So this tree suffices. Uh, Thomas Aquinas in his book would go on to ask certain questions like, oh, the water doesn't need to be pure water, flowing water, doesn't need to be, you know, how much water, 70% water, 30% dirt can or not, and the kind of thing. Uh, but that's a bit more, more technical, all right? So uh, modes of baptism and some debates uh, uh, on it over the years. Thirdly, baptism and confirmation. Uh, for traditions that do infant baptism, there is also that ritual of confirmation. Confirmation not seen as sacrament, but confirmation seen as a ritual where now the grown-up who has been baptized at infant at infancy now declares his allegiance, now declares of how he has encountered God's presence for his own life in a very special way and he has now come or she has now come to trust fully in the Lordship of Lord Jesus Christ. And so the ritual of confirmation allows this person to then declare his or her allegiance to God, to Christ. All right. So that's where confirmation comes in. And we see that uh, many traditions do have baptism classes and confirmation classes as well and confirmation uh, rites as well. Uh, and baptism and reception into membership, where does this fit in, right? Um, in many mainline denominations, Lutheran Church don't have, I think, um, uh, but even uh, the Anglican Church, I think, has this, uh, and that's baptism and reception into membership as a two-step process. You can be baptized into the universal church, into, a, into Christ as uh, one of the body of Christ uh, and one of the persons of the body of Christ, but not yet received into the local church membership. Um, You are part of the universal church, yes, but you may not be part of the local church yet because um, God gives vision, God gives direction to each local church and your allegiance may be to Christ, but perhaps, you know, you think, uh, you may say to yourself, "Um, I don't feel called uh, to reach out to Yochukang, you know, because uh, I don't stay there, um, I don't have a particular calling towards that area, but I stay in Topayo and I want to be a part of what God is doing in Topayo Methodist Church to reach out to the community, to be excellent uh, people who love and who reach out to our community excellently. And I believe in that. I want to be part of 
what God is doing in Topayo Methodist Church. Then we receive you um, into Topayo Methodist Church because you know that God has called you here and you want to partake in the life of the church. And this is where God has placed you in, in the local expression of the body of Christ. And so we receive you into membership. But we receive you in membership only after you have been baptized, right? Because uh, you, have, uh, you are through baptism, you are received as a covenant people of God. And when you're in covenant people of God, your allegiance is to God, your, 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 your trust is in Christ. And that trust and allegiance in Christ is expressed now in uh, being uh, able to uh, contribute your gifts, your talents, your time, your resources uh, towards what God is doing here in the local setting in the Parliament of this church, right? And that's why we only receive you into membership after baptism. And uh, baptism and remembrance of baptism. So some uh, who are infant baptized will say, I don't have the experience of uh, baptism. Can I be re-baptized? We'll talk about that later. But so we don't re-baptize, but we can uh, help you to remember your baptism. And you see a picture of uh, River Jordan there. So many people who go to Israel, right? They want to remember their baptism uh, at, in, uh, in Jordan River because that's where Jesus himself was baptized. baptized you know, wow, the significance of that. And so they, uh, most uh, Holy Land tour or trips, uh, pilgrimage trips, will include a remember your baptism or uh, uh, actual baptism. If you've not been baptized yet, you can do your actual baptism in the River Jordan. But those who have been baptized, you remember your baptism in the River Jordan. And the words are very clear. When we say, remember your baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's no, I baptize you again. You know? uh, no, it is very clearly a remembrance of baptism. And we do that in the Bible Methodist Church as well. We say to you, remember your baptism in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then you go down in water and you come up, right? So there's no ambiguity. They were already baptizing you. They're helping you to remember your baptism. And finally, baptism and re-baptism. Do we re-baptize people? Uh, and most mainline denominations, uh, in fact, only one uh, denomination that I know of, uh, uh, all do not re-baptize except one. Um, and that one that um, re-baptizes is the Anabaptist. Uh, and the Anabaptists re-baptize because uh, they only believe in the believer's baptism, right? So you must have come to believe before your baptism is efficacious, before your baptism is effective. You must declare your allegiance to Jesus Christ. And baptism is seen as that declaration uh, uh, of yours in your allegiance to Jesus Christ. And so even if you have been baptized as an infant, it is not effective because why? You have not declared your allegiance. Uh, you do not have the cognitive ability to be able to, uh, re to declare your allegiance when you're infant. And so they will re-baptize you as an adult. But uh, for the main line denominations and uh, most of the other denominations, uh, including Catholic Church, we don't practice re-baptism because we believe that baptism once you're baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, an indelible mark has been left upon you. You know, you have already been counted as the people of God. And at the end of the day, baptism is not only our action, isn't it? Uh, even as parents, when we baptize our children, it's not only our action, isn't it? It is God's action at the end of the day. We talk about how sacrament is instituted by God, and God himself uh, promised his, uh, his loyalty uh, even to his people who enact these actions. And therefore, we say that, you know, baptism is about God's act. Uh, at the end of the day, God's pouring out of his presence, of his Holy Spirit upon this person who has been baptized. He has now done that act of making this person part of the body, part of the people of God. And so, uh, in that act of baptism, therefore, God leaves an indelible mark in this person. And this person has, therefore, been baptized already. So, we don't uh, re-baptize. And again, I said that the only exception, I think, uh, when we uh, when the Methodists or mainline denominations uh, re-baptize is if uh, this person says, you know, I know distinctly that I've been baptized in the name of Jesus only. And uh, sometimes we even require uh, this person to get a letter from the church that has done this, you know, uh, the Jesus movement uh, church. And uh, to 
confirm that this person has only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Uh, and then we will rebaptize because uh, for us, we believe that baptism is efficacious in the name of the Father, the Son. And so on this, in this second part, we are talking about Holy Communion. All right? And Holy Communion is the new covenant that our Lord Jesus Christ instituted. And I think he deliberately uh, did it in the night in which uh, he celebrated a Passover together with his disciples to bring the intentional link between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. In the Passover, the people of Israel you know, reenacted the narrative of how God led them out of Egypt, out of slavery, to become a people of his. Likewise, in the Lord's Supper, uh, Jesus told us to remember, to do this remembrance of him, and we reenact right, uh, the institution of the, of the Holy Communion. Uh, we remember and then we partake of it together as a people of God. And it is so significant that, that all three of the synoptic gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, recorded of uh, the narrative of the institution of the Lord's Supper. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, by the Apostle Paul is particularly informative uh, for us because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23, 26, uh, which we would also now often quote in our liturgy, uh, in verse, uh, it, it says this, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. So this is significant, right? Because it tells us why uh, generations thereafter have always been practicing the Holy Communion, uh, not just because our Lord Jesus Christ instituted it uh, in the narrative, uh, in the Cinematic Gospels, but the Apostle Paul, uh, in a sense, declared what the, the apostles and uh, the elders of the church had been practicing thereafter. They passed on the teachings of Christ. They passed on uh, the Holy Communion, uh, the practice of the Holy Communion, right? What I received from the Lord, they also then passed on. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And those of you who are Methodists for very long, very long will remember, you know, in remembrance of me. And so in this Almighty Exodus in Jesus Christ, whatever, right? And so we then carry on with our Holy Communion. So, and then the Apostle Paul goes on to say, for whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so there's an implication here, whenever. So we ought to do it again and again. And secondly, we do, ought to do it all the way until he comes again, right? And so when we do this, we remember our Lord Jesus Christ, the narrative of our Lord Jesus Christ's experiences, his giving of his body and his blood, he giving, going to the cross, die and rising again, all the way until the second coming of Christ. Holy Communion is important to the church. And so we see Holy Communion as, a, as, our, as our obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Because he instituted it, he commanded us to do this in remembrance of me. And when we come for Holy Communion, we are coming in obedience to Christ. And for those of us, you know, who are, uh, especially now in COVID, right? Um, my struggle is that, you know, after a while, uh, we lose the significance of Holy Communion, and um, I know our health is important. Uh, I know that we are concerned about uh, the, the community cases, um, but if we are overly concerned, uh, then you know, we end up not obeying a lot of Jesus Christ. The church throughout history has been uh, continuing Holy Communion in spite of pestilence, in spite of world wars, in spite of persecution, in spite of uh, drought, poverty, natural disasters, they have always persevered on with Holy Communion. And we ought to persevere on as well because we are called to do this in remembrance of Christ. We need to obey the commandments of Christ for us to partake of the Holy Communion for our lives. Okay, so Holy Communion as obedience. Holy Communion as partaking in Christ, 
uh, when we partake of Christ's body and his blood, we are part of, uh, we now join ourselves as part of the narrative of Christ, of what he's doing in world history, in history of not just the church, but of the world. We're partaking in Christ's mission, in a sense, because now we say, now we receive your means of grace for us, we go forth back into the world to do your will. Uh, we are um, taking on um, the sacrifice of Christ for ourselves as our own response to God in sacrifice, uh, in, in, in being willing to sacrifice ourselves as well by joining him in his work. We receive of him, we join him in his work. And God gives us the means of his grace for us to do so. We are receiving of his grace for our lives to go forth to do that mission uh, so that generations thereafter may do this in remembrance of him. And that's the purpose, right? Uh, the purpose of Holy Communion is not just for us, but for us to be able to pass it down to the next generation. The implication is that generation after generation will know Christ through our partaking of the Holy Communion and through our joining him in his mission thereafter. Holy Communion is not only meant for us, it's meant for the generations to come as well. It's a grace that God has given us to perpetuate his mission and to perpetuate this remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, of what he has done. So Holy Communion as remembrance of us, of what he has done on the cross for us. And it's particularly important, isn't it, for the next generation of our children. Uh, when we do this, they listen to what Christ has done every single month. And that's why at Papaya Methodist Church, it's so important for us when we say, Holy Communion Sundays, we don't have children's ministry, we're all coming together as a family to partake uh, of Holy Communion. Because in a sense, it is also... Uh, uh, partaking of the new covenant, right? Just like the Passover, the families would come together and they would reenact the whole narrative. Now our, all our families come together as well and we reenact the narrative of the new covenant, okay? Because we remember uh, Jesus Christ and we help our children remember Jesus Christ and his acts as well. Uh, finally, Holy Com Communions, uh, Holy Communion, sorry, as witness as well. Uh, I said earlier that we come, we go forth, and we partake Holy Communion, we go forth and we witness to the world that we are the people of God. And when people see, oh, they're partaking Holy Communion, they know that these are Christians, okay? And perhaps through our partaking Holy Communion, people will yearn to want to partake Holy Communion, just like I was, you know, when I was young. Oh, I got to pass the elements by, but what? But, but, but pass. It was only when I come uh, the older, you know, then I part, uh, partook of the Holy Communion by myself, uh, uh, myself together with the rest of the body of Christ. All right, so Holy Communion as witness. Um, regarding this theology of Holy Communion, there have also been a different understanding of what the elements, uh, the bread and wine, or the juice, uh, signify. On one end of the spectrum is the doctrine of transubstantiation, and the Catholic Church believes in this. Uh, and the doctrine of transubstantiation believes that at the invocation, when we say, Holy Spirit, uh, make these elements the body and blood of Christ uh, for us, right? Uh, the very elements themselves, the bread, turns literally into the body of Christ, the actual body of Christ. Um, and the wine turns actually into the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the actual blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the doctrine of trans transubstantiation, right? And so you would see that, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's still the current practice, but in the past, the Catholic Church, they practice um, giving of the element um, in just a wafer form uh, in, uh, for the for the communicants for the for the um, for the church members, but not the wine because they were afraid that the wine would be spilled and they'd be spilling the blood of Christ. Whereas uh, for the wafer, it's easier, right, for the whole body of Christ to be part, to be to be taken uh, by the church members, right? So that's the belief on of transubstantiation. Uh, on the other spectrum, it's the, doc, uh, it's the belief or the doctrine of Holy Communion as purely remembrance. Okay, there's no, the, the bread and the wine uh, doesn't change anything else. There's no special spiritual significance uh, to the elements themselves. When we do it, we are remembering our Lord Jesus Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. And this pure remembrance, right? There's, there's no changing uh, in whatsoever of the elements uh, in the Holy Communion. 
Um, in the middle, somewhere in the middle, um, it's the understanding of the Holy Communion and the elements of the Holy Communion as conveying the very presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ itself contained within the elements once it's been made the body and blood of Christ through the invocation that now communicates his grace to us. His grace communicated to us through, via the presence of Christ, through the very tangible expressions of his grace, and that is the body and blood of Christ, the bread and the wine. And so that's what we Methodists uh, believe, that when we ask the Holy Spirit to make these elements the body and blood of Christ, it contains now the very presence of Christ. And Christ, by his presence, brings us his grace. And that's why we're so careful uh, with what we do with the consecrated elements thereafter, right? We say, you cannot just throw in dustbin, you know, because it carries the very presence uh, of Christ. Uh, and so we advocate, you know, if you have got extra elements and you have, you have, you know, you're not partaken of last month's Holy Communion, then these elements, uh, how you dispose of it is to uh, put it into your potted plant, for example, on the soil. So just as Christ gave his life, uh, may it spring forth new life as well. Um, and uh, I'm in the process of moving my house. And my wife yesterday, you know, passed me, hey, we got Holy Communion element, <laughs> two in one, extra one, what do we do with it? Uh, so I brought it down from my, from my, from my HV flat, I went to the, to the patch of grass in front, and then I yeah, put it in uh, where the grass was, um, to get part of the soil and put it in a prayer, small prayer, you know, that um, Christ, as I said, gave, given your life, may this spring forth new life as well. Yeah, so because we believe it carries the very presence of Christ, and the presence of Christ gives life, brings grace. All right, so uh, that's why sometimes you see, hey, why do they practice uh, the Holy Communion slightly differently? And sometimes it could be informed by the theology of the Holy Communion and what believe what they believe uh, the bread and wine uh, signifies. Okay, in the practice of Holy Communion, for us as Methodists, these are our words of invitation: Christ, our Lord, invites to His table. Three criteria: one, all who love Him all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. And so we believe that all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another, uh, the Holy Communion is available for them. And this person can come forth uh, to partake of the Holy Communion. Okay? Um, and that is why uh, when we use uh, uh, Holy Communion and the elements, uh, uh, we say, right, the table of the Lord is now open. Uh, because uh, now the conveying of the grace is made available to all who love him. Let's repent of our sin and seek to live in peace with one another. We use bread, wine. Uh, for Methodists, we use uh, grape juice. And because it is about um, God's presence, right? Uh, there have been various debates about the elements as well. Uh, remember in the last session, I said that the bread and the wine were very commonplace uh, elements or, or uh, part of the culture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is what they ate, this is what they drank at that point in time. Yeah. So the debate had been always, uh, how about the contextualizing of using uh, what we eat locally uh, uh, for Holy Communion? So in my seminary class, uh, when we talk about this, there was a debate you know, about how can we use prata and curry you know, for Holy Communion? Uh, and most of us said, yeah, you know, contextualize what, you know, if the culture, you know, always takes prata as bread and curry, you know, as part of their diet, why not? Uh, prata and curry, right? Interestingly, it was one of our uh, Indian classmates who said, no, 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 get on, get on, get on, you know, uh, because uh, she understands that culturally, right? Like what you said, right? Uh, prata and uh, curry to them is like yeah part of common food but when you eat of prata and curry they won't associate you as partaking holy communion and so she said that as far as possible when there is bread when there is juice or wine we should do that because that helps us to witness to the world and that's what one of the theology of holy communion we talked about earlier um, it, 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 it brings us in unity with the universal church but when we partake of Holy Communion using prata and curry, uh, I don't know what it will convey to the rest of the world, you know? Yeah, so, so we accept that because there are all these various aspects of our consideration of the theology of Holy Communion, right? But let's just say 
you know, die die. We don't have to use bread. We don't have to use uh, grape juice. Uh, if there's a need for us uh, to use other elements, we can. Because remember the three criteria: presence of God, uh, tangible elements, and thirdly, the intention. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Holy Communion and recipients. There have been various uh, discussions about who can receive uh, Holy Communion. And so you will see, a, even in the Methodist Church in Singapore, whether it is it the uh, English churches in the Trinity Annual Conference, in the CAC, Chinese Annual Conference, or in the Emmanuel Tamil Conference, they are differing practices uh, with, this, with this as well. Okay? Firstly, with regards to uh, unbelievers or non-believers of the Christian faith of Jesus Christ. Can they partake of the Holy Communion? Well, the general understanding is this. We don't stop them from coming to partake of the Holy Communion because you never know, right? Sitting there, uh, uh, going through the, the ritual, for all you know, uh, at that point in time, they have uh, uh, started to love the Lord, earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. So although we don't uh, stop them from coming forward, but the question is, is it significant to them if they actually do not believe, if they do not repent of their sin, and they do not uh, seek to live in peace with one another. So the imper imperative is on us to, I guess, follow up. If we do know of somebody um, uh, who, is, uh, who has not yet come to believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, and this person comes forward uh, to partake of Holy Communion, uh, well, the liturgy itself tries to explain what Holy Communion means to them, but I think the onus is on us there to, after that, follow up with them. Hey, do you know the significance of what you have gone through earlier? You know, do you want to believe in our Lord Jesus Christ so that it becomes even more so uh, meaningful for you subsequently, right? So that's important. Children, there are different practices as well. Um, some uh, believe that uh, even though children are being baptized, but... Um, they should not come to Holy Communion until they have confirmed themselves in the faith. Uh, they've gone through the rite of confirmation and they've declared uh, uh, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that's how they have uh, proved that they love the Lord and earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Uh, so some, some practice this way. Uh, whereas others practice allowing children to come to Holy Communion, and that's what we practice in our church and in most uh, 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 English Trinity Annual Conference uh, churches because if we had baptized them as infants and we believe that that is God's grace, God's activity, God's uh, initi initiative in pouring out His grace upon them, why not Holy Communion? Uh, if we baptize children, then children surely can come to Holy Communion as well. That's what we believe. All right. Or the unbaptized, right? As I said earlier, some people, some believe, some churches believe that, oh, if you're not baptized, you're not declare their allegiance yet so they cannot come for Holy Communion, right? Or the unrepentant, right? They are not earnestly seeking to repent of their sins should they come for, for, forward for Holy Communion. And that's why I think the liturgy of our Holy Communion uh, seeks to inform. Uh, uh, and that's why we see here preparation and then we see the words of the, the, of the, of the invitation thereafter, right? Christ invites the table, the three criteria. And if you fulfill the quite three criteria, we invite you to come forward. We are saying that, you know, come, repent of your sin and come forward to receive of God's grace for you. And then we go through step by step, you know, what Holy Communion means uh, in the Eucharistic uh, prayer, right? So that they understand the significance of Holy Communion even before they come forward, whether unbelievers, children, unbaptized, or the unrepentant, right? Uh, so that uh, they can receive Holy Communion meaningfully for themselves. Okay, so the liturgy uh, uh, plays a part. Okay, it's not, you know, we, don't, we, we didn't put it there just for, just, uh, you know, to lengthen the Holy Communion ritual, but each part of the Holy Communion liturgy um, seeks to address a particular concern that over time has developed, you know, for the church. Okay, and these are some of the concerns, all right? Uh, another concern was Holy Communion and the communicants, the stewards. Oh, the stewards, can they be um, non-pastors, non-ordained, you know, uh, do they fully understand uh, the uh, significance of Holy Communion? Uh, to, do they need to fully understand to be stewards? Because at, at the end of the day, right, they are communicating God's grace in a very physical way, right? They are the ones saying to the people as they give to the people, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ given for you, right? Uh, do they need to be, in a sense, holier people, you know? Uh, but this has been clarified in the early church. 
that uh, God's grace is conveyed in spite of uh, the sinful nature of people. And we all know that we all have sinned, even uh, you know, pastors uh, who are the celebrants. The Bible says, right, if anyone says you're without sin, you are, you are lying, right? Because we are all sinful creatures in our thoughts, in our minds, in our actions. Uh, we, are, we are all sinful creatures. And so, but God's grace comes regardless. And so, uh, stewards uh, can be lay people, can be leaders, can be lay people uh, as well. And that's what we practice in, in Topayo. Uh, we have our leaders, LCC leaders, who will serve as communion stewards uh, for us as well. Okay? And then communion and distribution. And so there have been debate in the past about whether uh, can Holy Communion be distributed down to the people or should they come forward to the altar table, right? Um, and the idea is this, the theology is this, uh, in the Methodist system, they, the people needs to come because while, we, while God invites uh, to his table, uh, that openness of his grace poured out to all people, uh, but in our Methodist Arminian theology, and that is, there is a free will for people to choose, they have to choose to come, right? The response is to come forward, right? And so uh, the, the theology behind that is that therefore, the people must come to the altar table. They must kneel down at the kneeler. They must come forward uh, to receive. Uh, over time, um, uh, sorry, before that, uh, and so when it's given down to the people, uh, uh, that's more a reform understanding, Presbyterian kind of understanding where, you know, God's grace to you is irresistible. You know, when it's given to you, you have to take it. We're coming to you and we're pouring out his grace upon you, right? So that's more the, uh, whether it's given or not. Uh, over time, uh, Methodist Church, uh, I think we have come to the understanding where even in our stretching out our hands, even when, like, the part you write, we practice our communion stewards go down to the people, we, we bring God's grace to the people, but the people still have to stretch out their hands this way, and uh, they, they have to receive the elements and to partake of themselves thereafter when we, when we partake of it together as a, as a church family, right? So there's a sense that even in these actions, there's already a response. So a pouring out or giving of God's grace is God's initiative and response on our part to partake of it, all right? So that's uh, the practice of Holy Communion, one of the debates in the past, whether distribution, people to come forward, or we bring it down to the people. And then the most uh, recent one, of course, is Holy Communion online, right? Uh, and this is my last point. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably end just slightly above time. Uh, Holy Communion online, whether uh, how we practice our online Holy Communion. And so in some countries, in some denominations, uh, they have allowed the uh, church members to prepare their own bread to prepare their own uh, juice or wine at home. Uh, you can use whatever wine you have, like port uh, or Pinot Noir or Chardonnay if you have, you know, Melo. Um, you prepare your own, your own bread um, and then the pastor consecrates it online. You know, uh, everybody who has prepared, you just put it in front of your, of your Zoom or of your, of your live stream and the pastor will just pray and uh, communicate that grace <laughs> online uh, over Zoom. Uh, some denominations have done that because of their theology, right? We have seen, right? The, there's so many different aspects of the theology of uh, Holy Communion. And so some uh, would emphasize the remembrance. Uh, it's about remembering. And so if it's just about remembrance, okay, uh, you know, once we say that we are all remembering, you know, whether you use your elements, my elements, what kind of elements, it's okay. It's, just, it's, it's remembrance. And so their theology allows them to do so. Yeah. For us, uh, in the Methodist Church in Singapore, uh, our bishop, when uh, COVID came, has said right, that uh, because we are partaking of it as one body from the one table, uh, and in our polity, uh, the ordained elder is the one who consecrates the elements, and so the elements need to be consecrated uh, uh, physically uh, together in one, in one sitting, in one table, uh, before it is being distributed uh, to the church members. Even the distribution, uh, you know, must be people who understand the significance of Holy Communion, right? So not, not just anybody, not, uh, cannot use la la move, <laughs> grab driver, <laughs> just do Holy Communion, right? It can be quite costly too, lah, by the way. Yeah, but the idea is the stewards are the ones bringing God's grace. They need to know what's, what's the significance, uh, minimally the significance of these elements that they're conveying, right? And they may not be holier than thou people, need, need not be sinless, 
but they need to know the significance. And so, uh, you know, it needs to be stewards who can either bring to your home or when you come, the, pe the people who are serving you as you come to the church to collect are uh, people who understand the significance of the Holy Communion. And that's what we're doing right now. We get people to come to church, collect Holy Communion elements uh, from our church staff who of course knows the significance of the Holy Communion. And then we partake of it together uh, as a church family uh, online uh, in, one, uh, in one sitting. And these elements are all pre-consecrated beforehand. All right. So there are still some uh, debates going on, even right now, after two years of how Holy Communion should be conducted. And uh, there hasn't been a robust uh, theology uh, that has been crafted out uh, uh, regarding this. All right. But it does fulfill the three criteria, still the principles that Thomas Aquinas had set out. Number one, when two or three are gathered in his name, and even online we are gathered in his name, God's presence is with us wherever we might be. Right, that's one. Number two, there are the physical elements, and then uh, the intention to make this the body and blood of Christ has already been done prior during its consecration. Okay, so uh, we are in line with the historic confession of uh, how Holy Communion has uh, been brought about in the past. Okay, that's the last thing I have about Holy Communion before we want to close with a very significant um, uh, sending forth song. Indeed, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Amen. Thanks everyone for joining us in Making Sense of Worship and Church. Do join us for the next Making Sense of by Pastor Zuhui. All right.